I'm Trevor Phillips. This is Common Ground. In a world of conflict and division, all too many believe that if you're not with us, you must be against us. But does every problem have to be solved by the loudest voices or the biggest armies? Tonight, day by day, evidence of torture, rape and murder emerges from Ukraine. Russia stands accused of war crimes. President Zelensky's people are hanging on literally for grim death. But the Kremlin's special operation launched, they say, as a swift strike to rescue Russians from rule by a nest of Nazis is not going well. Putin's response is not to retreat, but to turn up the heat. Britain's leaders are today urging no peace without a Russian climb down. They want world leaders to impose more sanctions on Moscow and send more arms to Kyiv. But the Ukrainian president called for talks and an end to the carnage. And some say it's not our place to sacrifice Ukrainian lives for our principles. Our choice, should we in the West do more to help Ukraine fight on against Putin? Or are we simply fanning the flames of war? In the next 60 minutes, two passionate believers come head to head in the search for common ground. With me tonight, the journalist and broadcaster Peter Hitchens and Dr. Jade McGlynn, author and academic at the Monterey Initiative in Russian Studies. Uh, let's start with you, Peter. Um, should we help Ukraine to continue fighting for uh, Russian withdrawal through sanctions and more weapons? I think that's really... I have to answer that with the question uh, that, that uh, the, the man got in Ireland when he asked where he should go next, and the man told him, I wouldn't start from there if I were you. This whole thing goes back so much further than that mm -hmm. that it's not a question I want to impale myself on. What I do want to say, absolutely from the beginning, because this is important for this debate even to survive, is that I utterly condemn as barbaric, lawless, stupid and unforgivable the invasion of Ukraine by Vladimir Putin. Uh, unequivocally and without qualification, and that in any part of this discussion, uh, anybody who assumes or presumes that I think anything else is making a major mistake. I understand you want to get your retaliation in first. I have to uh, get it in it. first because that, we're, we're, we're actually in circumstances, Trevor. I get that, I get that. Where, I get where that. Free, free, free debate I get that. is extremely difficult at the moment. Uh, not, if you not, don't agree with... Not, the not, not, on, not on this show. No, this, but I have to free take debate, every, have, And we will start from the premise... Every chance I get. No, we're going to start from the premise that everybody's here uh, on the basis of goodwill. Nobody here is an apologist for Putin or for cruelty or anything Good. of that kind. What we're really trying to understand is whether the West, and in particular our country, should continue to ramp up the sanctions and uh, offer the Ukrainians more weapons. And you may say it would be better if we weren't in this position, but we are. And I just want to get clear where you... We'll talk to you about how we got here in a moment, but right now, somebody has to make a decision. And if you're advising them, what would you be advising them? Well, here's a simple point. Both the United States and Britain have for some time, before this invasion took place, and before anybody could honestly say they knew it was going to be taking place, have been supplying Ukraine with very large numbers of weapons. Now, that hasn't changed, uh, except that the, the supply has undoubtedly increased, and not merely weapons, but also military advice and training at a very high level, and presumably uh, the, the terms on, on, on which those could be supplied easily. So that was already the case before the invasion. The second point that I'd make from my actual position on all wars is this. I, I, I am a, a Christian believer. I believe in just war, which is the, the, it's almost, almost never is it possible to justify war. It's never possible to justify aggressive war. All war should be d defensive and limited as far as it possibly can be. And as far as I'm concerned, the quicker that the war is brought to an end, uh, then the sooner the horrible suffering, which has already been inflicted on so many innocent people, will come to an end too. I'm shocked okay. by the almost right. total absence of any international effort we'll, uh, to we'll, get this war to end. We'll, and we'll, I want it to end. I have to say, we'll go, we'll if you go, see if, if you, the answer to your question is, if you see a fire, do you, do, okay. you, do you pour water on it or petrol? All right. I say water. What do you say? 
We'll go uh, into that in detail. Jade, let me ask you the same question. Um, Peter essentially says, we are, we've been pour pouring fuel mm -hmm. and that actually we should stop mm -hmm. and find some water. Mm -hmm. So I think that um, the only person or the only people who started this war are Putin and his advisers, of course, sadly, with the support of quite a few Russian people. Um, of course, there's a discussion to be had about historical, you know, what's happened about the historical background that's led us here, and I hope that we have time to get into that today. Um, but I think that if the Ukrainians are asking us for weapons, then we should provide them. And one of the main reasons for doing so is not only, of course, that we should take into account the agency of Ukrainians, which is something that Vladimir Putin is not doing, but also because, as we've seen from the images just this, that, have, that have come to the fore just this weekend from Butcher and the environs of, of Kiev, just because the battles stop doesn't mean that the killing will stop. Living under Russian occupation will not, will not put an end to the killing. Um, I think that the aim needs to be for Ukraine to... I'm not sure that it's a winnable war, okay. since, since I think... I don't think it's winnable for anybody, especially in the sense that, obviously, I think, and I hopefully, I, and I presume that I share this with Peter, I think that was Peter's point, that our main emphasis here and our main concern should, of course, be minimising the number of deaths of, Ukrainian, of Ukrainians. All but right. I simply don't think that that's going to happen by giving in to Russia. I, I think that there will be more deaths that way. All right, I w I, before we get into the meat of it, I, I want to just ask each of you to tell me why this thing matters to you mm -hmm. personally. Both of you have spent some time living uh, in Russia or Soviet Union. Um, you refer to just wars, St Augustine and all of that, Peter. I is that your motivation here, why you think this matters so much? Well, I, I am motivated by that, and it's, it's a very important part of my thinking. But obviously also, uh, I, I'm influenced by the fact that I spent some very important years of my life in that country. Uh, I arrived in Russia as more or less a Russophobe. Uh, I, I was also a hugely anti-communist Cold Warrior, not, not something I don't regret in the slightest. But I had developed the, the strong Russophobe feelings. Here was a country where they had lots of snow, bears, a funny alphabet, uh, and they were unfriendly and cold and horrible. And I discovered very rapidly that this was complete nonsense and ceased to be a Russophobe quite quickly. And in the time that I spent there, I gained something extremely precious. I, I, was, I lived in a country which doesn't exist anymore, where no one can ever go. I lived among Russians in extraordinary circumstances, and I witnessed events that nobody else will ever see. And I have this strong view as a journalist that from, from those to whom much has been given, much is required. And when I see huge misconceptions abroad uh, among my colleagues and rivals and in politics and in, in, in the national discussion generally, I have a duty uh, to speak out and say, this is mistaken, you have this wrong. OK. Jade, mm -hmm. why, why, why is it uh, an issue for you? Mm -hmm. uh, Unlike Peter, I've always been a Russophile. I fell in love with Russia when I was 13 and I taught myself the language from a book. I then went on to study it, obviously to do three degrees in it. But in between that time, in 2011, I moved to Russia and I intended to spend the rest of my life there. Really? Yes, I did. Um, and it was only the events in 20, that happened in 2014 um, that... The invasion of Crimea and all of that. The invasion of Crimea of and the shooting down of Donbass. But it was particularly... I was originally a, a literature scholar, not, not of politics. I only went into politics for my PhD. And I found it so devastating how people who I knew to be intelligent people were choosing to mouth falsehoods about, for example, passenger jet MH17 that was shot down in July 2014 about how it would have been preloaded with corpses. Um, and actually, it was all just a big effort by the West to malign Russia. And I wanted to understand how on earth a society gets to that point where its relationship with the truth and with reality is so broken. Um, and I think we're seeing, unfortunately, that actually what I hoped might be an extremity, um, a point of extremism in that relationship with the truth in 2014, was only the beginning of a very, very dark journey. And I would say that the biggest Russophobe out there must be Vladimir Putin because he's completely destroying his country's reputation. He is giving f so much fuel to people who are genuine Russophobes and he's put his own country's security at risk, as we can see, because obviously he sits amid a vast mountain right. of corruption. With that, right. I completely agree. Well, this is very interesting that we, we start from a premise that we have two people who basically love this country. 
Uh, Russia, by the way. Well, I love this one too. Uh, yes, let's let's not get into that. Both love Rus uh, Russia say. itself, and by the way, you know Anna Karenina, greatest novel ever written, except for <laughs> Charles Dickens. Let's start with you, Peter. Um, we can come to the history in a moment, but I just want to ask you about something that's happened today. Jens Stoltenberg, the Secretary General of NATO, said actually the next two weeks would be the right time to put the Russians on the back foot militarily because they are, if not in retreat, they're regrouping and so on. And now is the time really to step up the pressure. Um, is your timing just wrong? I don't know. I mean, I, I, am, I, I don't claim to be any sort of military expert. I have no idea. It would seem to me that you have a, a difficult position uh, for any kind of offensive uh, if, the, if, if one country has a very large army and it's established on the territory of the country that's invaded and the other country has quite a small army and not much in the way of offensive capacity, quite what it can do in, in, in the next two weeks to put the Russians on the back foot. In that sense, it also seems to me that the Russians are already on the back foot in that whatever their original, whatever Putin's original plan may have been, I think we can fairly, uh, fairly readily assume that it has, he's failed to meet it. They simply were not equipped uh, technically uh, or in terms of discipline or training to deal with, particularly with the lightweight anti-tank weapons which have been used to smash so many Russian tanks. They simply haven't coped with it. The, the whole, the, the whole invasion, if it was an invasion, has been beheaded. Uh, and they, the, the, there, are, there are areas where they've made some military progress, but in general, I think that the, the, they're already on the back. So what, why not simply uh, prosecute the conflict in a way that gets them out of, say, uh, I'm, out of Ukraine as quickly I, I, as possible. I'm not a military expert, but as, as I understand it, taking ground which is held uh, by heavily armed and equipped soldiers is a fantastic difficult thing to do. Uh, holding ground is much easier, and once, they, once they've got it, it's very hard to get them out of it. And I don't think, from what I know of Ukraine's armed forces, that, that they have much of an offensive capacity. So I don't, I don't see how that would work. But it, it, I'm happy, I'll happily concede that point to any expert who can tell me that I've got it wrong. But if I were asked to say, uh, is that a realistic prospect? It doesn't look to me, uh, unless we've been completely misled about the nature of Ukraine's armed forces and their size and, and capacity, that that's really much of a pros possibility, unless other armies come in, which I very much hope they won't. Do you um, accept that... Look, and to be clear, nobody here, certainly I don't, think that you are a Putin apologist or anything like that. But would you accept that the case for not ramping up the pressure could play into the Kremlin's hands, in which they might be saying, well, look, even clever people in the West are saying that they should, the Ukrainians should just give up and sue for peace now? Well, in, these, in circumstances like these, anything I say can be portrayed as playing into Putin's hands. Uh, it, but that, that would be to assume an, attention, an intention which I don't have. Uh, and you can't play into Putin's hands unless that's what you intend to do. One of the things that always amuses me is when I'm accused of being a useful idiot, something which, a term which Lenin is supposed to have used. I am a former yes, Leninist. About, about the and British the, Communist the, Party. The last thing you can accuse me of as a former Leninist is political naivety. Uh, but it, if you're going to have a free discussion in this country, I mean, frankly, I do not think that Vladimir Putin is sitting in his vast ballroom of an office waiting to hear what I say about the war before deciding what to do. I also Jake? doubt that. Um, however, though I'm sure what you have to say is very, will be interesting. Um, so, of course, I mean, if you just... You only have to watch Russian media to see that they will jump on absolutely anything that is said um, by people um, that could be construed as pro-Putin or pro-Russia. However, they will just create it if it isn't said. So I don't think there's any point really in getting caught up in that. Um, what I would say is that I think the more important thing here is to not see now that Russia's on the back foot, what I don't want, what I am wary of is any attempts to then force Ukraine or to try to push or pressure Ukraine into a ceasefire. Because I think that although it sounds nice, of course, who doesn't want the, who doesn't want the fire to cease? Um, in actual fact, Russians, as we've seen multiple times in Syria, will use that as a chance to regroup. 
um, and then it will um, they will interpret that as um, as Western weakness. And I think it's difficult. I think the issue of sanctions, for example, that you mentioned as well, is an interesting one because sanctions aren't. We can see nobody of any importance has resigned from Putin's sort of inner circle, as it were. So sort of, we say take the most forty sort of most high-ranking officials um, and and politicians. And they probably won't. And I don't think that the sanctions, having lived there in 2014 when sanctions were also imposed, um, quite quite strong, or well, it felt comparatively strong at the time, now obviously seems less so, there was a rally around the flag effect. I mean, it's not that people welcomed the sanctions, but it, it won't have the effect that it will bring people out onto the streets. What it will do, I think, is show Putin that the West isn't this decadent country, that uh, isn't this decadent space, um, and I use the, I know it's an imperfect term, but mm. collective West, um, that won't stand up for its values, that has given up on itself and that really will just sell out, um, but actually is willing to make sacrifices and, and hurt itself. But at the moment, I'm not quite sure that the West has made those sacrifices, has, it, has made those sacrifices convincingly enough. Isn't that a, a, a fair point, Peter, that actually, uh, by essentially trying to keep up, the, keep up the pressure, whether it's by sending arms, whether it is by ramping up sanctions or whatever, that actually what we're doing is sending a clear message to the Kremlin that their thought that they can push us around, essentially, is wrong. It's a perfectly fair point. I just don't think it's particularly relevant when what's actually happened has been a, a, a Russian invasion which has failed. And it plainly failed. And, well, it's, and, 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 and the, the, it, 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 has been, it has been decapitated. Uh, it's more or less halted in the, in, in the centre of the country around Kiev. Uh, it's now bogged down in various conflicts in the east, which were areas which the Russians uh, largely controlled in the first place. And that's it. And Putin, like, P it's P it's P P it's Putin has a pro problem with that anyway. It's just that it. I don't. Yeah, I, 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 that? But Ukraine is. Hang on a minute. I mean, let, let me just let, let me interrupt you for a second. Question. Yeah, but this one. Let you interrupt. Just to challenge one point. It's it's not just that's it. Ukrainians are still dying. And being tortured, say that was it, and, and, and murdered. I, I'm not. I, we, we, we immediately, one tries to deploy reason, and then, then someone brings in emotion. Uh, I am. Have, have, have you, you? You must have been in war zones. You must have seen. I have. What a human head looks like after a bullet has passed through it. I, yeah, I don't like it. It's a, disgusting. War is an absolutely disgusting event that nobody could possibly wish either to start or to continue any longer. And in war, I have to tell you, both sides generally behave disgustingly. It's not just one side and to, get, and, 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 to, and, and to make out that it is. There has been a war in Ukraine since 2014 and it's perfectly well documented. I've written about it, you've doubtless read about it. And in it, I'm afraid both sides have killed civilians. They do, but only and one they, country and this, invaded this, this, the other. This, this, only, this. only one country invaded another sovereign. Yeah, that's true, and, 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 and we, we've established that, and this, this is wrong, and it has to be put an end to. So how do you put an end to it? Practically. Mm -hmm. uh, practically and, 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 and effectively and swiftly, how do you put an end to it? That's a and the problem with the First World War, which is, which is in some ways a, 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 all this palaver reminds me of, is that the, the level of, of public war hysteria was raised so high on both sides that even though by the middle of 1915, most of the, of the major participants realized they made a terrible mistake, they couldn't get out of it because the war had become such a public issue uh, that they had to carry on fighting, even though okay. there was nothing to be gained. If you or, think this is war history, sorry. Yeah, no, <laughs> then I do I think would, it is war and history. And then I would yes. suggest, um, well, I would presume that you don't have a Telegram account in Russian because that is really war history. Just before we go to break, Peter, uh, let, let me ask you one, one thing, which is really, um, I think it surprises me about you. Uh, we've just been talking, and Jade makes point uh, that uh, the Kremlin thinks of us as weak and decadent. and. It seems to me the case you're making, it's perfectly rational, but it feels a bit like the sort of liberal Western self-flagellation that, you know, we are responsible and so on, that you rail against week after week in your columns and that, frankly, would lead the Russians to, be th to thinking that they're right about how weak and decadent we are. Well, I don't know. I mean, we, we, we may be weak and decadent, but certainly in terms of the, the military power of the United States, there's no question that, that is neither weak... We're not using it. That is not neither weak nor decadent. We certainly are using it. I mean, the U U United States, since the 1990s, when Ukraine first became independent, uh, has spent 
huge quantities of money on, on paying for Ukraine to develop military strength. And enormous. All right. Uh, and and, and we, we have to get on to at some point the issue of NATO expansion, All right. uh, mm -hmm. which, which, is, which is a vital part of this discussion. In, indeed. We are going to talk about that uh, a little later, but we're going to take a break now. Um, we're going to test the ground with Jade's view uh, after this break. Yeah, I tried to do this basic. I couldn't work for the basic. P45 on the late shift. Papa knows I can't afford to waste gifts. Had to justify the waiting. Reinvent yourself, amazing. You don't have to sign to make. All in your mind is undiscovered greatness. Oh, oh. sometimes it's shy, times hesitate to get involved. We actually started this company to champion black stories and black talent, but also just tell diverse stories. So we're very, very happy that these films are showing this week. I grew up in an environment that I feel like had certain expectations of black boys. The way that you had to carry yourself, the way that you had to communicate, the way that you had to dress. And I think a lot of it was survival mechanisms that lent into toxic masculinity. However, when I left this area and I went to university and I started working in the arts, I felt that I had to do the opposite. I almost had to code switch to make people that I was around feel comfortable and almost dispel the stereotype of black boys and black men that was in media. And so like, after that, I almost felt like I didn't fit into either of these worlds and none of them were a true representation of who I was. And so I wanted to make a film about that impasse of wherein you need to, that impasse of space wherein you need to decide who you want to be as a man. And so that's essentially what Butterfly Effect is about. Yeah, I mean, music videos uh, were and have been an amazing, I guess, stomping ground to be able to cut my teeth in terms of direction and working with talent. And it's been amazing. I think like we've been able to create like a few moments that have lived on in the in the world of music videos and hopefully they'll be joined by some narrative work that I'm going to do going forward as well. Con eso ya podemos ir evaluando entonces cómo el cambio climático va a afectar estos ecosistemas y eso cómo afecta prácticamente toda la cadena. O sea, si afectamos a los productores primarios, que son las microalgas, vamos a ver afectado obviamente todo el resto de los organismos. I love my job because. I get to do something that is contributing to a better future. Welcome back. This is Common Ground. I'm joined once again by the journalist and broadcaster Peter Hitchens and Dr. Jade McGlynn, author and academic at the Monterey Initiative in Russian Studies. We're talking about whether the West should be doing more to help Ukraine fight on against Russia. Um, Jade, uh, let's um, talk about your thoughts that actually we should really be put, putting the pressure on the Russians. Um, what do you really expect the end game to, to be here? You know, it, this could be heroic, but the charge of Light Brigade was heroic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the end game, I, I can't pretend that I exactly know. I don't think anybody can, and if, if they say they do, I wouldn't trust them. Unfortunately, I think what it looks like we're going to have is a very long, nasty and drawn-out war 
And uh, the main reason for that is, of course, because the Russians invaded, but it's also because, because the Ukrainians, um, I think, have surprised everybody. This, I'm not a military expert, but they certainly surprised me um, with um, both their capabilities, but also with their, their real commitment um, to fighting. But ultimately, for Vladimir Putin, this is... Um, he also perceives this to be an existential fight. The Ukrainians quite rightly perceive this to be an existential fight. It is. It's a fight for their very right to exist. That is what denazification means. Um, in Putin's language, it means de-Ukrainianization. Um, they've been very explicit about that just today and yesterday um, in state media and with uh, politicians such as Dmitry Medvedev. However, for Russia, Putin, he is also seeing this as quite an existential question, but more in terms of his ability... Um, to show Russia as a great power, his ability, and perhaps slightly as well, his ability to stay in power because of um, any sign of weakness could presumably be pounced on by elites. But this is Putin as a tribal chieftain. He's going, he wants to bring the Slavs together and all of that, and he's been pretty clear about it. But in terms of our stance, um, you know, we're thousands of miles away from the action, and it's OK for us to say they should fight on, but actually they're, they're dying. Mm -hmm. No, of course, and I think um, we shouldn't be the ones saying... I, I really disagree with the idea of, of, of course, fighting to the last Ukrainian. That's a horrific idea. I have many, many friends in Ukraine, and that would not be something I'd be advocating. However, that's not what's happening. Ukrainians are asking us for arms because they want to defend themselves, and it's their right. If they want to do that, I personally think we should support them because I think that they're dying for values that we in the West are supposed to espouse. Whether or not we always live up to those values, that's a different discussion. We certainly don't live up to them as much as Ukrainians are right now, um, but I think we should support them in that fight because eventually, do we think that the ki the the, ma the killing that what we're seeing is essentially a, a genocide of Ukrainians? This these awful sort of murders of civilians, you know, these, these rapes of children. Do we think that they'll just stop in Ukraine or do you think they'll come further? Because fine, for us in Britain, we may be some way away, but Poland isn't, the Baltic states aren't. There's lots of threatening comments um, coming out um, from Russian politicians now towards those. And then that does start to affect us because of course they're NATO countries. And then that's our broader discussion that I think we'll come to later. Yeah. But um, that's, I don't think it's a case of fighting to the last Ukrainian. I think it's a case of they want um, support, they want, they're asking to help defend themselves and we sh the least we can do is help them to defend themselves. Peter, um, we, we've been mining the biblical references. Uh, it feels a little bit like uh, Jade is saying we can't walk by on the other side. Well, we haven't walked by on the other side. Uh, the question is what the best way of not walking by on the other side is. I don't remember the Good Samaritan providing a submachine gun or an anti-tank weapon to the Good Samaritan at any stage. That wasn't his job. Uh, the, 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 the question remains, how did we get here? Uh, what is this? Why are we in this? As I say, the, the, whole, the whole question goes unexamined. I was in Moscow the day that Ukraine left and became independent. Uh, I remember Boris Yeltsin uh, complaining that the, the, the new independent Ukraine, by containing uh, large numbers of Russians, was going to have great difficulties. And he also made this issue about uh, Kazakhstan and I think other parts of the former Soviet Union, and being immediately rebuffed by the then-President Kravchuk and told to shut up, I think probably also told to shut up by the Americans. And looking back on it, one has to wonder whether it wouldn't have been better if Ukraine hadn't come to some agreement about this long, long ago. I'm amazed at the feebleness of efforts to obtain peace, uh, the, the collapse through almost total lack of interest of the Minsk agreement uh, and, the, and, and the, the Normandy variation on it, which were, which were supposed to avoid, uh, avoid war and, and, and to end the 2014 war. The, remember... Volodymyr Zelensky, Zelensky was a, a, elected on a program of attaining peace. He tried very hard to do so and very bravely went to confront uh, some of his own soldiers who resisted it. Um, his, his predecessor, Poroshenko, campaigned against his attempt to gain peace. Uh, I think Zelensky deserves enormous credit for the efforts that he made. I do not think there's much sign, if you look at the diplomacy of the period between 2014 and now, of the Western countries, but 
particularly the United States, making Sorry. any serious effort to avoid this war. I won't go further than that. I will also refer Sorry. you to a very important point. I, I, th I th haven't yet had anything like as, as much time as Jay just had. The, no, no, I no. Think, I think no, the, listen, I think, I've got the clock. You don't worry about the clock. No, no, make, I, make I do worry about the clock. So, so she can actually get I'm to speak. I'm it. And, and, and it. And it goes like this. Last Friday in the Daily Telegraph, Fraser Nelson quoted a senior diplomat as saying that the, uh, the, a view in, in the West was that they wanted a long war in which Russia could effectively be bled white. OK. So, um, Peter's, uh, Peter's point, Jade, is that actually... Uh, we're essentially fighting a proxy war mm -hmm. at the Ukrainians' expense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I didn't a... say that, actually. No, I know you didn't, but no, that's well, a, then it's not I'm, I'm, I'm putting that to her. You're putting there's it to her. It's not a, what I said. There's I said a few something. points that, that Peter did make, actually, that I would like to come, come on, on to. So the first one is about the number of Ukrainians. Um, there are, uh, sorry, the number of Russians in Ukraine. But there are loads of Ukrainians in Varonezh, in Bransk, in Belgorod. What, that, why doesn't Ukraine then have the right to go? In, that's just... there, there's an answer to this, which mm -hmm. is very important. The nature of Ukrainian nationalism mm -hmm. is not like Scottish nationalism. It's not civic nationalism. It's very ethnic. And the arguments over language, for instance, have made quite a lot of Russians, particularly in Crimea and in, and in the East, as you'll know, because you've been there, very uncomfortable with what's going on. If the language, if the language law of Ukraine was imposed, for instance, on the, on the French speakers of Quebec, mm -hmm. uh, they, they'd explode. All right. language okay. Absolutely. Let, there is, there is, there is, let Jade, is, let Jade when, make her point. Are you referring to the language law of 2014, or are you no, the, referring the, the, to the amendments well, the, made the, in 2022? I'm referring to the basic... The, 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 Jade, just... Under which... Jade, carry on and make your point. OK. Um, so, this is just a narrative that is completely out of control. Of course there are some nasty nationalists in Ukraine, but the idea that Ukraine isn't a country fueled by civic nationalism... What are we seeing? What are we seeing right now? Ukraine is a country that has an incredibly robust civil society, which is one of the reasons why its resilience in this war has been so incredible. We clearly cannot say the same of Russia. Russia is a country that is only unified around a war that it won 80 years ago and that it's not allowed to properly remember or properly mourn anyway, and where the 27 million dead are just used to help Putin and his other sort of kleptocratic mates get richer and stay in power. So I don't think there's any... I'm really surprised that you would sort of dismiss the idea of civic nationalism in Ukraine. Well, Most Ukrainians it. speak right. Russian. I can't speak. I, I, I study I Ukrainian and I can't speak. There's nobody who would speak can, Ukrainian can, to me in Kiev. Can I just, can I just respond? I don't dismiss the Very idea briefly. of civic nationalism. Well, why should it be brief? It's an important well, question. Because I, I want you to be... You did, you, look, I, I, let, let I, me I just remind you... I think yes is make a point, all right? No, no, let, let, me, let I, me remind you what you said. What you said was you have to understand the nature of Ukrainian nationalism yes. and it is not civic nationalism it's like not, Scottish no. nationalism, not Scottish National Party. Much it is ethnic. ethnic. That's, yeah, that's much, what you said. Much more ethnic. And, and, and the, 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 the worship of figures... Very controversial figures. You mean like Stepan Bandera? Worship of figures such as Stepan Bandera is, is very shocking to large numbers of, of, of Russian-speaking Ukrainians, and always has been. There, and there's the, the, the naming of, of football stadiums after Roman Shukhevich is also pretty shocking, too. Mm -hmm. You look up these okay. people. They're not... Know, it's not... It's, it doesn't... It's, 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 like, it's like erecting statues of, 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 of Jerry Adams in Warrington to some people. It just isn't a very sensible right. thing to do. Before, there, the, the, okay. the, lang the language issue is not minor. All right. If you, if you want... To, okay. Okay. Want to get into the Ukrainian civil service, the chances made, are you have to speak Ukrainian. You've made the point. Um, before, before we go to the break, I just want to quickly ask you a question, Jade. Um, you said earlier on, of course, correctly, that we're providing defensive weapons. Mm -hmm. Is there a danger that what we're actually really doing is saying uh, that we're providing weapons, a lot of support, to allow the Ukrainians to lose slowly rather than to win? We're not giving them a weapons by which they can mount a counteroffensive. Mm -hmm. So, is there any point? Well, then maybe we should give them weapons to mount a counteroffensive if that's what they need. Clearly, we need to start thinking now about the medium term. Clearly, the Russian army has been gutted by the corruption um, that rips through every single aspect of Russian society, very sadly. Um, so, I, perhaps we should start thinking about that. I do just want to come back on one point because just, I think it's so very important. On, yeah, very, very briefly, on um, the worship of Stepan Bandera. Now, I agree with you. I think Stepan Bandera is was obviously um, a terrible person. I have no time for... And there are the, a Ukrainian nationalist who leader. Worked, yeah, who, who, whose followers collaborated with the Nazis. And, yeah. and, mm -hmm. However, 
Apart from in a very small area of the West, the support or the support for him is very low. Recent polling shows that people see him as one of the most divisive figures in Ukrainian history. Well, and okay. men... but, 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 but All right, enough. Central, I, central I've got, government I've, passes, I've got a call. I've got a, laws honouring him. I've got to call a halt because uh, we've got to go to a break now. Uh, we've heard what both of our guests think about each other's cases to an extent, but I um, want to take some control here and see if we can find some common ground in a moment. communities to grow food in lost and unloved spaces across the city so our main kind of driving force is to get people growing Welcome back. I'm joined once again by the journalist and broadcaster Peter Hitchens and Dr Jade McGlynn, author and academic at the Monterey Initiative in Russian Studies. We're talking about whether the West should be doing more to help Ukraine fight on against Russia. We found out some of what our guests think and think and why. Um, and now, my challenge, can we find, if not some common ground, at least some common understanding? And let's start maybe with a, um, a negative one. Um, how much of this situation has been created, as the Russians would say, by NATO's decision to expand to the east in the 90s? 
well, I think an, an, an enormous amount and huge numbers of people have, have, have warned against it, uh, in, including Henry Kissinger. This is the, 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 the one issue on which Henry Kissinger and Noam Chomsky united. Uh, from the very start, the senior diplomats, uh, Jack Matlock, uh, President Reagan's envoy to Moscow, who, who dealt with, uh, with Mikhail Gorbachev, was against it. Yegor Gaidar, the prominent liberal Russian politician, actually went to his friend, the Canadian ambassador in Moscow, and begged him to try and prevent NATO expansion. It's just been over and over and over again. Uh, the, the, all the intelligent diplomats have said, don't do this, it will create in, in Russia, which, if, if you remember when this began, was entirely different from the way it is now. It will create in Russia uh, a defensive nationalism, which is extremely dangerous, and it insults the, the people in Russia who had in 1991, um, had actually achieved a, a, a Russian democracy for the first time since Lenin smashed it up in 1917. So that's, uh, it, it's hugely important, and anybody who ignores it is making a great mistake. And the other thing which is totally ignored and was barely reported, in any Western media was the nature of the, of, of the violent mob putsch, which overthrew the legitimate government of Ukraine in February 2014. 2014, yeah, when uh, young Kovic, I think it was. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, Jade, what do you think? Uh, how big a part does history have to play here? OK, that's a, that's a huge question. I wrote an 80,000-word thesis on that. <laughs> so I won't go into that in, in too much detail. But um, I think history has a great role um, in terms of how Putin uses it to legitimise um, his crimes in Ukraine. But I just want to come back to the NATO point. Now, clearly, an opportunity was missed to... Um, create um, a more inclusive European security framework um, in the 1990s. I think that I would find that very hard to argue against. Um, I think that the West made lots and lots of mistakes um, with Russia, including sort of um, supporting um, Yeltsin even after the shelling of the White House, including sort of their um, helps for him to sort of rig the elections and including their support for, sh for shock therapy, um, which has given rise to a narrative of humiliation by the West. The economic shock yes, therapy. Yes, the economic shock therapy, exactly. Yeah. Prices up. Yeah. Let the market let the market flow and yeah, all of that. Yeah, exactly. You used to be able to afford a house. Today you can afford a car. The next day you can afford a fridge. The next day you can afford a sandwich. Um, this sort of um, rapid um, impoverishment of the Russian people. And the 90s was definitely a terrible time. And I think that NATO also made a mistake with the Bucharest Memorandum because they led Ukraine on. They Clearly, Ukraine was never going to be able to join NATO. However, and this is a big however, a lot of the NATO expansion narrative, and even that phrase is slightly problematic because you have to ask, well, why did everybody want to join? I mean, NATO didn't force, NATO didn't force the Baltic states to join, they, they obviously, or Poland to join. They obviously wanted to join for a reason. I think perhaps now we're looking at maybe some of the reasons why they might have been frightened for their security. But even with that, this is very much a narrative for external consumption for the West. This isn't really a narrative that comes up in Russian justifications that are actually in Russian language for their own people. That is... Right. Well, Putin doesn't say this to Russians. I, I, not I, really. I, I mean, he does mention it. It's not that it doesn't exist, but it's very I, I, much for external In consumption. 2007, mm -hmm. at the Munich, the Munich conference, mm -hmm. Putin specifically raised it as an yeah. issue. And the is Russians the re at the, the Munich Security of, Conference? The no. Response of, but... Sorry, wait a minute. The response in 2008 at the Bucharest NATO summit was mm -hmm. that George W. Bush proposed that Ukraine should join NATO. If You, you can't really imagine a bigger, a, 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 a bigger two fingers that, that anybody could have offered. Uh, having been uh, 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 after the, after the I've, speech. I've was already said that I think that the Bucharest memorandum was stupid, but I think the problem that you're doing here... It's not talked about. The Russians are... Gaidar No, but about. the problem is here that you're applying... Uh, just you're trying to apply essentially a sort of realist Western paradigm to understand Russia and what it's doing in Ukraine when it's based on emotions. Well, it's based on imperialist it's, 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 understandings you, and history of Ukraine. Would you defer to George Kennan? As somebody who knows more about Russia and the Soviet Union than either of us. You better of course, explain everybody knows George what Kennan. George Kennan said around NATO expansion. I've already said that I think it was a mistake that there wasn't a more inclusive European security framework constructed after the fall it's, of the Soviet Union. It was much Union. more specific than that. George Kennan was the inventor of the Cold War. He oh, was, the man, he was the man who... Well, not everybody watching this will know this. Okay. George yeah. Kennan was the man who devised the policy of containment, which eventually defeated... Mm -hmm. the Indeed. Soviet. And I, in 1998, he said something which I really think I, people need to know. He said of NATO expansion, which had been rammed through the Senate by Bill Clinton and also by, by, by okay. very heavy lobbying by arms contractors. He said, I think it is the beginning of a new Cold War. I think the Russians will gradually react quite adversely and it will affect their policies. I think it is a tragic mistake. There was no reason for this whatsoever. No-one yes. was threatening anybody but else. This expansion 
will make the founding fathers of this country Okay, we don't, we don't, don't need to rush the whole... Do they need to react? Vital so, document so, of... Peter, honestly, honestly, your point is made very clearly without the supporting uh, statement. Yes, but, uh, but let's, it's a good um, support to have. Yeah, OK, OK, OK. Russia or... But the point, the, the point here, if, we, if I can bring it back to ground, is that actually um, the, question is, the question was really, uh, as you said, that uh, the West's decision to bring in some of the old Soviet possessions, as it were, uh, the Baltic states and so on into NATO, was uh, seen as a provocation. Jade is making the, the point that that might be what they say, but it wasn't yeah. the motivation for mm -hmm. this particular... No, it wasn't. Uh, ..this the particular action. Let, let's... Uh, uh, you, 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 you are not going to agree... You're not gonna, uh, you, how about Paul Wolfowitz? Yeah, you're not going to agree about Wolfowitz that. Let me... Let, Paul Wolfowitz right. You're not going to... You two are not going to agree about that. Let me try something... Let me try something different here. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that will be uppermost in viewers' minds right now mm -hmm. is a humanitarian situation. Mm -hmm. Is there any point in which... at which that takes precedence over, if you like, the um, state, the actions of states. Because what we've been talking about now at the moment is what governments do and what governments don't do and so on. But is there a point at which actually things become so extreme, Mariupol perhaps, uh, some, uh, some uh, of the suburbs of uh, Kiev and what we've seen on TV, that actually all of that has to be put to one side and there has to be some kind of intervention? Well, when you say intervention, intervention by whom? What I mean is boots on the ground, no fly zone, anything to protect. Oh, I see. I thought you meant. I thought you meant that, that body called the United Nations, which seems to have been struck down. For the <laughs> yeah, past absolutely month. useless. Yeah. Well, I think. Okay, we can all immediately. Uh, can um, we can all the, already the agree that the United Nations has not been very useful well, in this where context. Where have they? But let's. But, let, let, but let's. Where let's has anybody been to tr trying to trying to secure peace? Well, let's... An almost total absence, as, as with the Minsk, as with the Minsk yeah. agreement. There it was, a possibility for peace. Nobody, the major sponsors of it, did okay. nothing the to Minsk get it enforced. The Minsk agreement was, was very difficult because, essentially, Ukraine and Russia had two very different ideas about what the Minsk agreement meant. And you, I appreciate why you want to sort of bring the US into this, but really, so Germany, and, but Germany and France... But they can, had, can, can, I, can you stick to the question France, I've asked you yes. both? Is there a humanitarian... Uh, cause is there a moment when the deaths and the cruelty meted out to people uh, supersede, if I like, yeah. if you like, the strategies and the interests of states? Well, of course, and I think we've long since reached that point. But unfortunately, Putin they have a lot of nuclear weapons, so we need to be realistic about what a no-fly zone means, and. It would mean only more dead Ukrainians through the use of a tactical nuclear weapon, Most probably on that. Ukrainians. I mean, it, would, it, would, it, would draw, it would draw the whole of Europe and possibly the United States into a general war uh, and would be an act of, of, of something near insanity. And if, you, if you're talking about the sort of uh, idealistic intervention that was made in Iraq in 2003, I think the civilian death toll from that was, was pushing towards 200,000 dead, dead people and huge numbers of others maimed, rendered homeless and forced into, in, 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 into becoming refugees. These interventions... And, and Libya, there was a humanitarian intervention by Libya, remember that? It turned the place into a cauldron of screams. And it still is, is, is in total chaos, thanks to our humanitarian supposed intervention. Be very careful about being seduced by no, that I, I particular I couldn't agree phrase. more on Libya, but obviously uh, we're discussing Ukraine. OK, so uh, we've got one piece of common ground, which is don't be tempted by the humanitarian impulse. All right, I'm going to ask both of you in a moment to tell me if in this discussion... Um, You've heard anything that's changed your mind about your own view. Uh, uh, you obviously, I think I can say pretty clearly, has not, have not been persuaded by each other, but I'm going to ask you to just give me a minute each uh, on that. But what I think we have both agreed is uh, there are no Putin apologists here. Everybody's appalled by what's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody wants this to stop as quickly as possible. Uh, nobody thinks in this room thinks that we should be putting... Uh, boots on the ground or imposing a no-fly zone. Um, what I'm not quite hearing is how we get out of this hole. So, Jade, mm -hmm. what have you learned? Mm -hmm. So, I found it a very interesting conversation. I am no, in no way saying that Peter is um, a Putin apologist, but I do find it interesting because obviously some of the points he raises are also quite common points in Russian media. Um, so it's been quite interesting to debate those, um, but with somebody who's putting them forward logically rather than simply 
in the services um, of, of Putin. Um, and I think it's important that they are debated. I, I think that um, it's important to understand and to contextualise. I just happen to think that Peter is focusing on the wrong points of context, that he's bringing them too much to the fore and trying to make general rules out of things that are really small issues or, or not as important as others and loses sight of the bigger picture, which is that Russia has invaded Ukraine. It is pursuing a policy of genocide to destroy the existence of Ukraine. And we have seen pictures of charged children's corpses, of, of raped children, and we really need to bear that in mind when we get into these discussions. We need to bear that human cost in mind when we get into these discussions over sort of what happened when in, in 1943. Peter, is there anything that you've heard from Jade that has made you think, uh, maybe I should moderate or modify my position or my understanding both of the past and what we might do now? No, I think we have a lot in common. And I, I, I wish that, that people in the British government would uh, get hold of Jade. They certainly won't talk to me, would get hold of Jade and ask her because she actually knows something about the subject about which most of our, our, our government are totally lamentably ignorant. Uh, they, they, they know nothing about the history or nature of the problem at all. So I would very much hope they would, they would listen to her because she has a lot of sensible things to say. I would point out, as always, uh, that we're all uh, horrified. Uh, by the, the butchery and, 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 and murder of war, and, uh, and that unites all human beings. No one should use that in a rational argument to gain any kind of, of advantage or suggest that they care uh, more than anybody else. Uh, we all care, I trust, equally, do we not? But let me just actually quickly ask each of you, just 30 seconds, what, what should be the next step? What, what would you do tomorrow? Mm -hmm. I would start training Ukrainians to help them on counteroffensive weapons because NATO very soon is going to run out of its supply of Soviet-era weaponry and we need to start thinking about the medium term because, unfortunately, this is going to be a protracted war and I don't think Putin's going to give up on his obs obsessive desire to possess Ukraine. Good. I think it's time that the General Secretary of the United Nations put together a serious plan uh, for bringing an end to the war as soon as possible before it spreads and becomes a general conflict lasting for years. Well, here's what I, what I think. I think uh, that it's going to be very difficult to find common ground between the two of you because actually you attribute what's happening today to very different causes. Peter, understandably, uh, we haven't had time to go into the depth of history, I think, that you'd like, but no. I think we've got some sense of... Uh, where you think the West has failed to create the uh, conditions to avoid where we're going here, and that, to this, some extent... This, Trevor, this was such a great opportunity. And to some extent, we've allowed when it to I, When happen. I was in Moscow that day, when, in, 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 in 1991, when the whole thing collapsed, I was so completely filled with hope, and it's now all been squandered. And to see this is just so tragic. It's, uh, I, I think, again... Yes, you know, and, I, and, I get, and I get your point, but your point is essentially that because we've allowed that opportunity to go... Uh, missing, uh, that go begging, I beg your pardon, uh, we haven't really now got much in the way of weapons to solve the problem. Uh, your, your point, I think, Jade, is that whatever that background is, uh, we have to do everything that we can do, at least to try to minimise the suffering. The thing that strikes me in some senses about both of you, and I don't mean this in any sort of terribly negative way, it's, it's to be honest, rather a gloomy piece of common ground, is that at some level, both of you think that whatever the outcome, whatever path we take, the Ukrainians are basically bound to suffer for quite some time to come, and there is almost nothing that anybody can do about it. And maybe uh, if there's common ground here, it might be that um, our government needs to tell everybody don't look for the cavalry to come over the hill well, to solve this one. I think there are things we can do, and one of the things we can do is calm down the, 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 the war hysteria and the idea that this is Gandalf versus the orcs. It isn't. It's much more complicated than that. OK. And we should... There is also, in this, in this society since 1945, we have had a mechanism for the prevention and ending of war, okay. which we're not using and which we should use and which every civilised government should be putting pressure uh, on the United Nations and the, and the combatants to observe. It's time this ended. We don't want any more corpses. In we don't want course. any more refugees. In theory, of course, but in reality, we can see that there is absolutely no preparation towards making peace in Russia. The person who's the head of the peace delegation is um, a complete 
slightly over-the-top patriot and nationalist who thinks that Russians have a special gene because of their heroism in history. And he is now being called a fifth column, a traitor to the Russian people, because he even suggested even slightly moving um, in that direction. That didn't happen without somebody saying some, a nod, an editorial nod in the Kremlin. Okay. There's, no, there's no position. They're not moving towards peace. They're not preparing for peace. Well, it's, it's, it's very, OK, it's, it's very striking here that we're really t saying that the passions that are being played out there are not going to be controlled. But I am very grateful to both of you to de for dealing with such a difficult and passionate subject in a civilised and rational way. Quite rare. That's all from us this week. Next week, we'll be joined by two more passionate advocates in the search for common ground.